I'm delighted to be before you again in a continuation of the series of studies on evolution and special creation. And this is the final session, the final study in this series. And I'm reminded that the famous Samuel Johnson once said that the task of every teacher is twofold. First of all, the teacher has the responsibility of making new things familiar, and secondly, making old things newly valuable. I hope that I've done that in this series, and that's what I want to do tonight. The task of teaching about things that have to do with the eternal destiny of men and women is very important, and I hold it as a great responsibility. May I put before your hearts again this evening several texts of Scripture that set the background for a study like this. Hebrews 11, verse 3, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Psalm 19, and verse 1, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Or turn in Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 18 for one of the great statements in the Bible about the creative acts of God. The text reads, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. This declares the great power of God and the purpose of God in creating the world. That the earth was made with a purpose in mind that it might be inhabited. God had us in mind and may we have him in mind as we study together tonight. In 1 Peter 3.15, we're told that we should sanctify the Lord God in our heart and be ready always to give an answer to everyone that asketh us a reason for the hope that's in us with meekness and with fear. With an attitude which would be received by people out of meekness and with a reverence for God, we want to try to give the strong reasons why we believe what we do believe. I remember one time going on a trip and I stopped in a service station and as I got out to go in, I saw a little sign in the window. It intrigued me, and I wrote down what it said. It said, don't ask, ask us for information. If we knew anything, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> well, we ask people to ask us for information because we believe we know something that's worth knowing. And the fact of the matter is, it's important being here to know that information so that we may go there. I'm not interested in propagandizing. You know what propaganda is? That's baloney disguised as food for thought. We want you to study and think and weigh carefully what we have to say. This evening I want to launch into a continuation of what we began in the previous study, and that was the arguments that are made by the evolution based on the idea of fossil men or their arrangement and interpretation of evidence that they claim shows that men have been evolved, derived, from lower animals and especially from apes and monkeys. And so we want to launch right into that and I want to first of all suggest to you the inherent problems that they have in that that we need to point to. The first thing that we need to understand is that in all of their discussions, evolution is assumed. Whenever they put together a picture like this, which purports to be a picture of uh, the evidence, they claim that this arrangement of the evidence is correct, or at least pretty correct, and they keep changing it all the time. They're putting before us the idea that we have evolved from, from apes. But the problem is that what they do is that they assume the very thing uh, that really they're attempting to prove. And of course, if you assume the thing that you're attempting to prove, it's no wonder that the material that you put together as a result of that tends to prove that. It's that kind of circular reasoning. Now, in order for them to come up with this, this developed picture here of, uh, of fossil men, here's what they do. They take what we might call an operational definition. Someone said that's the one that you use until you find out the real one, but an operational definition which is based on the idea that you take the bony features of living hominidae men and the bony features of, of living pongidae apes and you take the features that do not overlap and you say this is a man and this is an ape and when you find some fossilized remains you put them between apes and men under the assumption of course that uh, man has evolved from the lower animals. Now going further on that the reconstructions that they have made as this are wrong. They are 
wrong and admitted to be wrong. Let me just suggest to you that if you'll go to the Time Life series called The Emergence of Man and look at the Neanderthal volume, you'll find that they commissioned an artist to take a Neanderthal skull and then they showed you what he could do with it. In other words, an artist could put on the same skull the face of a man and that of a chimpanzee and what they were admitting is that the reconstructions in the past have been misleading. How could the early reconstructions of Neanderthal man's appearance have been so wrong? They were wrong. They admit that. And that leads us to ask the question about all of these reconstructions. How do they come up with these? Evolution is assumed to start with and then with a highly developed imagination. Reconstructions made which now they admit at least in the case of Neanderthal, are wrong. Now, here is a group of diorama figures which was used in a famous museum for many years. And in this volume, they admit that these diorama figures misled experts and laymen alike. They were wrong. Now, if you look at uh, these reconstructions, here's at least nine reconstructions of Neanderthal. And what you discover is that now, the position that's held and what you'll take in, a, if, you, if you're studying a course in anthropology, you'll soon discover that, that they say that Neanderthal is really a man. He may have had crude features, but he was an intelligent man, a thinking man, a worshiping creature. What they're admitting then, that the reconstructions are wrong. What I want to show you, though, is that the data upon which they base the whole series here is so terribly sparse that it should astound us that they should claim that they're able to really tell us the story of the past. Let me just, for instance, take this statement from The People of the Lake, which is a very helpful book if you want to study the history of the development of the interpretation of fossil men, written by Richard Leakey and Roger Lewin. Not only is there no single complete skeleton we can lean, learn from, but we don't even have a big enough range of fossil fragments from which we could make up a 100% identikit ancestor if we were to try to piece together into a kind of composite skeleton the fragments we have of our direct homo ancestor of about two million years ago, the task wouldn't take very long. Simply because there are so few pieces to slot into place, the product would be pitifully incomplete, a skull and possibly part of an arm, a couple of leg bones, and perhaps half of and a little more. We need to understand then that the admissions are being made by the evolutionists, even as they propose these reconstructions and display them in magazines like the National Geographic, that the data upon which they're basing these is very limited. For instance, note this by David Pilbeam, famous anthropologist. I know that at least in paleoanthropology, data are still so sparse that theory heavily influences interpretations. Theories have in the past clearly reflected our current ideologies instead of the actual data. What he's really saying is that what we're doing is we're taking our ideas and imposing them upon the data and the result is that the picture more represents ideologies than it does the real actual facts. And that's very important as we think about this. Now what I want to do then is trace the history of this so you'll see that when the creationist is dealing with this matter of, of fossil men, like all other evidence that we bear with it, we want to look at it and see it for what it is, but also to show you what it is not. And this is so important. Now we start tracing the history, the so-called history of man. If you'll look at this diagram here, they claim that it begins back here, if you will, with Ramapithecus. They go back, they claim, some 12 or 15 million years ago. I'll have something to say about the dating methods in a little while. Now, they have hit upon Ramapithecus as the real beginning then of what they would call the evolution of apes into men. They say it took place 15 million years ago and then they have a gap of 2 million years for what they call the Australopithecines. Now let me just trace a little bit of history with you. Talk a little bit about who Ramapithecus is. The first findings of fossils were in 1932 in India by a Yale student. 
and it was called Ramapithecus after uh, a character in an epic poem. And they say it's about three feet tall, found in Africa. Leakey found it in 1961. Fragments of the upper and lower jaw were found. And so there are about 30 individuals that have been found, that is parts of individuals, found in Greece and India and Pakistan, Hungary, and Africa. Now the admissions that are made about this creature are very interesting. Now they have a leap between Ramapithecus and Dryopithecus africanus. In other words, 20 million years ago, so you have about 5 million years ago and not a trace in the rock record of any intermediate forms. Now the admissions that are made by Leakey are important. Richard Leakey says, now to be absolutely honest, I have to admit that we know nothing about Ramapithecus. We don't know what it looked like, we don't know what it did, and we don't know how it did it. Then an interesting investigation was undertaken by Dr. Robert Eckert of Penn State. What he did is he made a comparison between this creature Ramapithecus and Dryopithecus and a living population of apes. And then the result of it was, in certain areas of measurement, he found there was far more variation in a living population of apes than there was between these two that they have postulated go back multiplied millions of years ago. <coughs> Ramapithecus seemed to be an ape morphologically, ecologically, and behaviorally, but why would they want to call it then a precursor of man? Because of the nature of its teeth and its jaw bone and the way the teeth were set. And when they first interpreted it, they put together these fragments like this so it a human. But when they found the whole set of teeth, there was obviously a difference between this and this, isn't there? And it's obvious that you're dealing here with an ape. But they said that because of the nature of the teeth and because of the jaw, because of certain features that it had, that that has to be the precursor of man. But you see, there's a great problem with this. The basic problem is... <laughs> that there is in Ethiopia, in the high altitude, a baboon, which is called Theropithecus galata. And it has small incisors and canines, closely packed and heavy worn cheek teeth, powerful muscles, a short face, and it is an ape. Now to go back and point to something that's like this, that lived in a so-called ancient time, and yet we have the same features as a living ape today. It says that we're starting off with what is a big blunder. But now let's trace how they have attempted to develop this family so that you have the evolutionist argument for from apes to man. Prior to 1972, we go to that group of creatures that they would term the Australopithecines, which really means the southern apes. And there's a fascinating thing about this. The first one that was found was found by Raymond Dart. And here's a picture of Raymond Dart. Some of you may have seen in the issue of, of uh, National Geographic, you saw the cover which had a hologram on it and had the, the skull of a child the Tuang uh, skull, and that was found by, uh, by this man, Raymond Dart. But then there was also found by Mary Lee, found also another one like that, and that was in 1959. Now, Dart found his in 1924. But let's just begin to trace now the history of what really happened and see an interesting story of what they tell us about the apes to man idea. In 1971, Richard Leakey challenged the idea that these were two different groups. And he, he made the argument that they really were the Australopithecus boise was a male and the Australopithecus africanus was a female of the same species. In the same year, Richard Leakey challenged the idea that Australopithecus walked upright. You see, you can make these, when you reconstruct them, do about anything you want. And the idea that you have them reconstructed, as in the picture we showed you in walking, you know, you can do that. And then further on in 1971, 
What Richard Leakey did is that he challenged the Australopithecus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens idea that they had put before them. And here's the reason why. He found a juvenile, Homo habilis, in a level that was lower than Australopithecus, which, it, which means that you have Homo habilis living before Australopithecus. And you remember that old song, I'm my own grandpa. You've got some problems here as to, if you've got the sequence as he's put it here, and then you find this one living before that one, you have a lot of problems. And this is one of the things that you find as you follow the history of this, how fascinating this is. Now, the, the Leakey family, the Leakey family, this overhead series, but he spent 40 years looking for the missing link in Africa. That's Alice B. Leakey and Mary Leakey and Richard Leakey. And what happened is that as a result of his studies, he found Homo habilis, the Australopithecines, and Homo erectus contemporaneous. They were, they were together. So the idea of going, you know, like this up the stair step of development is switched over to here they are contemporaneous with one another, uh, living in the same area. So when we look at this, we've got some interesting developments. If Homo habilis had been before Australopithecus, you got some real problems. And then the Leakeys found the remains of what appeared to be a circular stone habitation. And almost all evolutionists argue that you do not have such structures on the emergence of modern man. Now you talk about confusion. Now when you change the way they depict it, now they've got both of these over here and now they're coming down this route, Homo habilis, Homo erectus. But then you still have got some further problems that are very interesting. Now the Australopithecine find were dated two or three million years ago. But Homo habilis was dated much younger. And then a startling thing happened that blew the whole thing up. <coughs> In 1972, in East Turkana, Africa, Richard Leakey found the famous skull, 1470, and that's the skull that's pictured on his book, his best-selling book, Origins. Now, skull 1470 was classified as Homo habilis and dated at 2.8 million years. Evidence that the Australopithecus africanus, Australopithecus boise habilis lived at the same time Leakey claimed. Now get this that 1470 is more modern than Peking or Java Man. Now, these were supposed to be Homo erectus. What he did is, he found a remains with morphological, that is, from the standpoint of his appearance, was more modern looking than that which was supposed to be much younger than that. You got some interesting conclusions uh, that uh, we come to here. Now, Dwayne Gish has pointed out, and he's a well-known creationist, he points out that if what Leakey reports about his 1470 is true, and if the dates assigned to this creature, to Zinjanthropus and to Peking Man are valid, then Zinjanthropus and all the Australopithecines and Peking Man are wiped out as man's ancestors, and evolutionists are left with nothing. Now in Science News in 76, it was stated if Homo did not descend from the Australopithecus, where did we get our start? And then Dr. Alan Mann in Anthropology University of Pennsylvania. We just don't know what has happened. There are no real theories. Everybody is sort of astounded. It has thrown us back to go. Now, this idea then of tracing man's origins to Ramapithecus is absurd because we have a living ape like it. The idea of tracing it back to Australopithecus is blown up because of the finding of something that was... Uh, dated much earlier and more modern looking. The whole thing is, is thrown into disarray. And then let me share with you a statement from Solly Lord Zuckerman. For many years he was the head of the Department of Anatomy at the University of Birmingham and was first knighted and then, that's Birmingham, England, by the way, and was first knighted and then raised later to peerage as a recognition of his distinguished career as a research scientist. Now what he did is for 15 years he researched the Australopithecines. And never with a less than a four-man team. And after 15 years of the Australopithecines, he made the following statement. He said that 
if man evolved from an ape-like creature, he did so without leaving a single trace of information in the fossil record. The attempt then to trace the origins of man 15 million years ago on the dating of Ramapithecus won't work. The attempt to, to trace it back to Australopithecus won't work. So what we're faced with is that as you and I look at the interpretation today, this is the one that's put forth usually like in National Geographic and that, and yet it has all kinds of problems. After 1980, what they have derived now is that they're looking for some remnant of Ramapithecus and dating at three point million years old and then looking for something in here and still retaining what we'd call this descendancy. Now let me just share with you a few statements to summarize what the situation is. Talking about Homo habilis. Here's what Alice B. Leakey said. I must submit that morphologically it is impossible to regard Homo habilis as representing a stage between the Australopithecus africanus and Homo erectus. You can't go back to Ramapithecus. You can't go to the Australopithecines. And you, when you try to go to Homo habilis, you're messed up. We may very well have to accept it as rather unlikely that any of the Australopithecines, including Homo habilis, can have had any direct phylogenetic link with genus Homo. This is a, a famous authority in this area, Charles Oxnard. Going in further here, Dr. Ernst Mayer, the renowned evolutionist evolutionary taxonomist says the homo erectus stage is characterized by a body skeleton which as far as we know does not differ from that of modern man in any essential point. The main differences from modern man are a more massive skull and dentation and a smaller brain which overlap the size of that of modern man. What we're saying here is you remove the australopithecines, you can't point to homo habilis and when you get to homo erectus what they're saying is fundamentally is not any different from modern man. Now then, Pilbean and Simons, two respected authorities, say Homo erectus found throughout the old world during much of the uh, middle Pleistocene, and they talk about 500 to 600,000 years ago, is barely distinguishable taxonomically from Homo sapiens. What I'm trying to show you is that the case is to be made by the creationist that the evolutionists have not established that there has been evidence of a development from apes to men. It isn't there. It just isn't there. E. Al Simon says, in spite of the recent findings, the time and place of the origin of, of the order primates remain shrouded in mystery. All of the considerations of the earliest primate evolution remain very much a matter of opinion and are speculative. Richard Leakey and Lewin said, if we were to try to piece together into a kind of composite skeleton the fragments we have of our direct homo ancestor of about two million years ago, the task wouldn't take very long simply because there are so few pieces to slot into place. The product would be pitifully incomplete. A skull, possibly part of an arm, a couple of leg bones, perhaps half of a foot, and a little more. I'm repeating that. I gave that to you earlier to emphasize what the real issue is. The idea of trying to prove the evolutionary development of man from the fossil evidence, fossilized remains, an ape to man progression, it isn't there. W. H. Rush has pointed out, therefore it may be concluded that fossil evidence offers no support for any schemes of the evolutionary descent of man, either within the hominid genera or from primate ancestors. And then this one. It's interesting like Mark Twain one time said, there is something fascinating about science. One gets such wholesale returns of conjectures out of such a trifling investment of facts. Now what we're trying to show you, if you trace the commonly uh, depicted idea of the development of man, it just doesn't fit the facts. Now, take this statement by Alwyn Simons. In spite of recent findings, the time and place and origin of order primates remain shrouded in mystery. In other words, we do not know. And then let me close with what I think is probably one of the most telling observations about this whole matter. This statement by David Pilbean of Harvard University, as he talks about the attempts to reconstruct and to, to present some sort of a pictorial development and, and represent this as historically the development from apes to men, he says... Perhaps generations of students of human evolution, including myself, have been flailing about in the dark that our database is too sparse, too slippery for it to be able to mold our theories. Rather, the theories are more statements about us and ideology than about the past. And that's exactly right. What they are telling us is how they view man. Man is evolved from lower animals. God is not the creator. 
And this ideology is speaking louder than is the data. In fact, it's controlling everything they do with the data. Paleoanthropology reveals more about how humans view themselves than it does about how humans came about. Now then let me turn to the matter of the question of the age of the earth. This is a big issue to many people as we talk about the question of evolution and special creation. How old is the earth? The age of the earth that is given today by those who are using radioactive dating methods is four and a half to five billion years old. This is the argument that's presented by the evolutionists and then it's also argued by some non-evolutionists. There are some people who say they believe the Bible but they want to fit in what they think are the assured results of the evolutionary investigation and so they want to harmonize the two in some way and so they want to in one hand, on one hand cling to the Bible, on the other hand they want to accept this uh, age of the earth and so a number of different theories are involved in that. Now, why do people believe that the earth is that old? And let me, and this is what I, my task is to discuss this tonight. First of all, because of the appearance. They say, well, it just looks old. You look out there, common sense says, it tells you that this is really old. Well, you know, looks can be deceiving. And one of the most interesting ways that, to illustrate that is, is something that happened off the coast of Iceland. Surtsey Island. This thing came up out of the sea and within a short period of time it produced astounding things that gave the appearance of great age. The Icelandic geologist Thorensen observed on Surtsey only a few months have sufficed for a landscape to be created which is so varied and mature that is almost beyond belief. Three weeks later, after he had visited, he goes back to the same place and he was literally confounded by what meets your eye. There, there are these cliffs of considerable height and below them you see boulders worn by the surf and some which are almost round and an abrasion platform cut into the cliff. What he says is that within a short period of time work has been done on Surtsey Island and it just looks like it's a lot older than it really is. Yes, appearances are deceiving. We've heard arguments made, you know, that the coal deposits are evidence of something that took literally billions of years, or millions of years anyway, uh, to bring about. But recent studies have shown that the formation of coal can take place rather rapidly if you have enough heat and you have enough pressure. And we've discussed this as we talked about the matter of uh, geology, that, that the issue is not over whether or not there are rock formations out there, but how did they get there? The issue is whether slow forces over a very long period of time, slow, limited forces, or large, gigantic forces. And what we've shown in the laboratory is that it's possible to produce coal in a relatively short period of time. These observations suggest, and this is a study made by Dr. George R. Hill of the College of Mines and Mineral, Mineral Industries, University of Utah, these observations suggest that in their formation, high rank coals, anthracite and volatile bituminous, were probably subjected to high temperature at some stage in their history. A possible mechanism for formation of these high rank coals could have been a short time rapid heating event. So what we need to do is we need to look carefully at that claim or we need to look carefully at the claim with regard to oil. Of course, we all have been taught about how oil is supposed to have been produced and yet uh, there have been demonstration in the laboratory that in 20 minutes uh, you can take cow manure and convert it with the right amount of heat and pressure in 20 minutes to very usable oil. What we're saying here is that the reason why people say that the earth is very old is they, they say well now common sense means well it just looks old or they argue that rock formations demand it. In other words you look at the geological formations out there and someone says well it just stands to reason it took a long time. Well sure it took a long time you may say if you can postulate that it was just done consistently at a slow pace and they'll tell you that these levels of rock took hundreds of thousands and even millions of years for them to be deposited. Until you look at something like this which is in Lompoc, California this is what we call a polystrate fossil. Here's a whale that's 80 feet long. 
upright going through all of these layers that they would tell us or lead us to believe would take millions of years to form yes if it was done slowly and gradually but the evidence is that it, in order for it to be preserved it had to be rapidly buried and with the great length of this and the number of layers of rock that you have there this is strong evidence that something was done very quickly and rapidly under conditions that are mighty unusual. And this is what is called polystrate fossils, referring to the number of different strata through which they pass. And we have a number of examples of trees upright like this. Now, if you take the position that here's a tree and then it stands up there and millions of years go by while this rock formation is being made, that doesn't sound like a very sensible explanation. A much better reason is that we have geologic work that was done rapidly, not slowly. And that's the reason why when you discuss this whole matter of geology, that you have to take into consideration two ideas, either catastrophism or uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism is that very slow, gradual forces over a long period of time are working today. And they worked in the past. And that nothing took place in the past that's not taking place today. It's an argument which is called a doctrine, it's called in the geology text, the doctrine of uniformitarianism. Why? Because it's a presupposition, it's a thing that's assumed in the interpreting of evidence. But we come back as creationists and ask the question, which interpretation of the evidence is right? It's not an argument over the evidence, it's an argument over the interpretation of the evidence. Slow forces over a long period of time, that's uniformitarianism or tremendous forces working rapidly over a short period of time. And that says that anybody who's being fair, objective, and really looking at the evidence should weigh carefully the evidence that shows us that things were done rapidly, not slowly. That there are facts, there are data that cannot be explained simply by the idea of uniformitarianism, the slow, gradual method. Now the third reason why besides saying it looks old or that the concept of geology insists upon it. Yes, uniformitarian geology insists upon a very old earth. But a study of the evidence shows that we're not compelled to believe that it was put down there only slowly and gradually over a long period of time. But the third argument has to do with radioactive dating methods. That's why they believe the earth is that old. Radioactive dating is not a way of getting a boyfriend girls. That's not what that is. But now, radioactive dating... What are we talking about? And there are three major methods that people are familiar with. There's the uranium thorium lead me method, and this is what gives them dates in the billions. And then there's the potassium argon, which gives them dates in the millions, and you hear this being talked about when you have discussions of fossil men. And then carbon-14, which gives dates in the thousands. Now let me just try to simply describe what we talk about a radioactive dating method. There are elements that are unstable elements and in nature these elements are called radioactive and they disintegrate. They're going towards stability. And what happens is in the case of uh, say the parent element and here's the daughter element. In other words, one is supposed to be derived from the other. In the case of uranium, U238 and that's been connected with the, with the bomb, you know. And then as a result of disintegration or of radioactivity on a period of time, they would suggest to us that if you are able to find in a deposit a parent element and a daughter element, you find the two of them together. In this case, uranium-238 becomes lead, PB-206, and in the process, it gives off the gas helium. Now, we're told that we now have a clock in other words, if you can determine the amount of lead and the amount of uranium and seeing this is the parent element and that this daughter element was derived from that and you can relate the one to the other, you have a clock. Now we need to talk about clocks and the t telling of time. What do we mean by that? And, and what is a clock and, and how do we tell time? Now, there are the following assumptions in any kind of a clock. If you want to know, I've been talking, and there are several out there who know exactly. I tell people I don't watch the time. I have about a dozen people all the time who do that. 
But if you want to know how long I've been talking, you need to know the initial condition. You need to know when I started. You need to know the final condition. What does the clock read right now? And you need to be reasonably assured that the thing that you're telling time by is, is fairly accurate. I spoke one time in a church building and they had a clock in the back and it was not working right and it, when it got to the top and went over, you know, at the top at 12, it went down real fast. It went, woo, like that. And then it went real slow the other way. And the brethren, after a couple of services, came and asked me if I was trying to tell time by that clock and I didn't know there was something a little funny that the first part of the lesson went real fast and the second part went real slow. Now we've got a clock down and we've taken it down. The brethren have got it down because it was running slow. It was a preacher's clock, you know. Look up, it isn't that, it isn't that late yet. But the point I'm making is in order to tell time, you need to know the initial condition, the final condition, and the rate at which the clock turns. And when we talk about this radioactive dating that we were discussing a while ago about uh, uh, in, that, in that picture that I gave you there of the, of the parent element and the daughter element. These assumptions are very important to study. The assumption of the initial condition. In other words, it's assumed in setting this clock that at the very beginning there was nothing but uranium there. There was no lead. Now the one thing that radioactive material has helped to establish is the universe had a beginning. No longer do you have scientifically the comfort in any way of the idea of the universe being eternal. We were in an earlier session talking about what Dr. Robert Jastrow talked about. He said that a lot were back to the God question because it's now being admitted that the universe had a beginning and one of the things that's helped people to determine that is radioactive material. But the point that you've got to understand is that you can't really know that you have a clock until certain things you can be assured of. You need to know the initial condition, you need to know the final condition, and the rate at which the clock turns. Let me illustrate what I mean by that. Suppose I go into a place, and I take you in there, and I said, now, look at this candle here. You see this candle? Now, we've made very careful tests, and we've determined that once every 24 hours, three inches of this candle burns. And you go in there, and there's a candle that's six feet tall. And I ask the question, when you measure it, and you know that it, once every 24 hours, that three inches of it burned, how long has it been burning? It's six feet tall. How long has it been burning? Anybody who stops and thinks about that would say, well, you don't know how long it's been there if you don't know how long it was to start with. And that's exactly right. And so what happens in these clocks, these radioactive dating methods, and using them as clocks is that there's an assumption that at the beginning there was nothing but lead, and nothing but uranium and no lead there. Can we make that assumption? We, we really have no right to absolutely make that assumption. We don't know. Then the second thing is, when, when you go and study a sample, you have to be sure that you've got a good sample that has not been affected in any way. No leaching has taken place. Because if something has disturbed the sample so there's not a true relationship between, like, uranium and lead, you don't have a clock. And another point is, can we be assured that the rate at which radioactive materials disintegrate has never varied? Well, you know, people say, well, it's not affected by light and heat and temperature and things like that. But there are good, solid studies to show that the rate at which radioactive disintegrate place has varied in the past. Extensive studies have been made by a man named Dr. Robert Gentry at the Oak Ridge uh, establishment in Tennessee. And he studied what's called pleochroic halos. And over 50 years ago, Arthur Holmes said, if, if we're going to find out whether or not there has been a variation in the rate at which these things are disintegrated, it's going to have to be in the place of, uh, or the area of Pleochoric halos. And what Robert Gentry has said, and by the way, Gentry was one of the men who testified in the Arkansas trial, and the evidence that he presented there, all of the scientists there said that they didn't know what to say about it. They did not know or, uh, how to handle it. He presented something that to them was they couldn't explain it. But what Gentry has found out that if radioactive disintegration has always been consistent and constant and hasn't changed, then you should be able to look in these rocks that have radioactive inclusion in it and notice fracture lines which should be clearly predictable. Because you see when this breaks down it gives off helium and the rock is, is fractured. But Gentry says you never find these kind of consistent fracturing marks. 
And his conclusion is that the rate at which radioactive material is disintegrated has varied in the past. Now what we want you to see here is that when people come up with these dates, and when they put out books on it, if you read a book on radioactive dating, you'll read 280 pages on the sophisticated methods they have for dealing with disintegration and terming the half-life. Half-life is how long does it take half of it to disintegrate. But you won't find much discussion of the basic assumptions that are used in the dating method. And so what we're suggesting to you is, is that there are a lot of problems, obvious problems. I'll give an example that when they were, whenever they went in and they dated Zinjanthropus in Odovi Gorge, that which was connected with the leakies. And they came up all of a sudden, you know, hit the headlines. A two-man team from the University of California said, we've determined that the remains are 1,750,000 years old. That went in the Sunday supplements. People read about it. But they didn't follow up in the journals and read later where a man named von Konzingwall went in there and he found some real problems. He found a lower layer of basalt which should have been older but it was younger. He found a lot of things that were contradictory and that they just didn't fit. Now, I don't want you to get the idea that I'm arguing that scientists have got to, you know, they've got to have all the answers and everything's got to be perfect. The only thing I'm saying, we don't expect them to have all the answers and the nature of science is that every one of their conclusions is suspect. It's open to question. The difficulty I have with it is that people begin to argue, we have proven this, this has been established, and the truth of the matter, it has not been. This is a quotation from Strauss and Hartle where they talked about this. Because some of the Odovi Gorge dates are inconsistent, some must be inaccurate, they may all be, until further tests determine which materials have definable dates, we do not know which dates are accurate. Until this is learned, the indicated ages must be taken cum grano solis. That means, of course, you Latin students know, with a grain of salt. Until contradictory dates in existence and duration of unconformities are resolved, the dates are of doubtful value in formulating hypotheses about the rates of evolution of man and his culture, rates of other vertebrate evolution and migration, rates of soil development, rates of accumulation of volcanic ash, and the persistence of ancient lakes. Now, the evolutionist, looking at radioactive dating methods and the rock formations and his presuppositions that it took a long time for them to be laid down, he concludes his interpretation is the earth is four and a half to five billion years old. Now, on the other hand, creationists will look at not only the radiometric dating methods, and by the way, I've got a book up here by, by Melvin A. Cook, Prehistory and Earth Models. He studies four of these methods, 40 of these methods. And he was the world's leading inventor of slurry explosives and a professor at Metallurgy University, Utah. And as a result of his examination of these, uh, he says that if you make the proper adjustments based upon the assumptions in the methods, that you reduce this not to millions but to thousands of years. Another interesting book on the age of the cosmos and discussion of these dating methods, and not only these but others, is Harold Slusher's book, The Age of the Cosmos. But not only do we look at radiometric dating, but we consider catastrophism in which things could be done more rapidly uh, than the uniformitarian position would allow oil well pressures. They tell us that those who studied oil well pressures, that if, if the earth was billions of years old, you could not possibly account for the kind of pressures that you now have. There's just no way that the earth could be that old. Or to take the helium inventory. We know that uh, on the basis of this radioactive disintegration, helium is given off, but there's not enough helium in the atmosphere to account for four and a half to five billion years old. It's all, everybody admits that. Well, how do you explain that then? Well, there's a lot of data, we know. population kinetics saying if you went back as far as they say and had the proper uh, multiplication of the number of people that there's just no way to account for the number of people that we have now by that method and the idea that they push man back into the millions of years. The rapid uh, earth magnetic uh, fields decay, polonium halos, the shrinkage of the sun. In other words, what we're saying here is that there's a, there's a body of evidence for a young earth and it's interesting to me that in the Arkansas trial, there was one man, this was very interesting, W. Scott Morrow, he's a biochemist at Wolford College, and, and he is an agnostic evolutionist, and yet he said that creationists actually look at more data than the evolutionists do. And when you study the dates that have been derived as a result of radioactive dating, there's some interesting things, and we don't have time to go on all of that, but 
certain Russian volcanic rocks gave ages of 50 million to 14, 6 billion years, although they're believed to be only thousands of, a few thousand years old. We know, for instance, in Hawaii, volcanic rocks have been extruded underwater only 170 years ago, and yet they gave potassium argon dates from 160 million to almost 3 billion years. Volcanic rocks on Reunion Island in the Indian Ocean yielded PB206, U238, and PB206, PD207, ages from 2.2 to 4.5 billion years, but potassium argon ages from only 100,000 to 2 million years. We're talking about when people begin to say, well, we've, all, we've proven this, this has been established, that the, con the, the response of the creationist is, no, this has not been established. Discussions of starlight in the age of the universe, and I have material to discuss that, and I won't have time to discuss that tonight. It's one of these uh, things that when you're under the gun of time, you can't deal with everything. But we're always prepared personally and privately to discuss those things and also to present uh, reading lists and a bibliography. But what does the Bible say about the age of the earth? Does the Bible tell how old the earth is? And where did 4004 B.C. come from? It came as a result of a man named Usher adding up the, the genealogies, the chronologies that are in the Bible. And one man, a man named Bishop Lightfoot, was very precise about this creation business. Uh, he figured that Adam was created on the 24th of October at 9.30 a.m. Now that kind of stuff has been a big problem for people who are, are defenders of the Bible because of people mocking and making fun of that. But what we need to consider when we study what it says, we need to study how the genealogies were kept. We need to understand that in keeping the genealogical tables, generations were left out. We can establish that clearly, for instance. You can't take a, what we call the adding machine approach and just add up the genealogies in the Bible and come up with any kind of a thing that gives us a date for creation. That's just a misuse of the genealogies. Now, for instance, you can compare the genealogy that's in the Old Testament with, for instance, the genealogy that's found uh, in Matthew for Jesus, and you can see that a number of generations were left out. And then if you'll compare uh, the data that's in Chronicles, the first nine chapters of Chronicles is the greatest concentration of genealogic material that's in the Bible. Now, if you'll compare that, uh, that material with, with, for instance, what you find in Ezra, here you have a number of names that were omitted. The point that I'm making is that, that we have no right to go into the Bible upon it our own idea of how to keep genealogies and how people use them. We need to understand how they did it, and they left out generations, but that's not to argue that they left out a thousand generations for everyone they put in. But what I'm trying to say is that we're not committed to a date of 4004 B.C., but let me give you a simple way to illustrate the idea of leaving out, for instance, a generation. Go to 2 Kings chapter 9. In 2 Kings chapter 9, we have a statement or two statements that will help us to see this, I think, very clearly. 2 Kings chapter 9, And when thou comest thither, look out there Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. Well, it's obvious that his father was Jehoshaphat and his grandfather was Nimshi. But come on down later in the same chapter in verse 20, and it says the watchman told, saying, He came even unto them and cometh not again, and the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he driveth furiously. There was a hot rodder even in the Old Testament period, O Jehu. But he's called in verse 20 the son of Nimshi. Jehoshaphat is left out. So that you can have even this idea that Jesus is the son of David, the idea that he is a descendant of David. What we're trying to say is that the idea that the Bible teaches that the creation took place 4004 B.C. is a result of adding up the genealogical tables. We have any right to do that. I don't know how old the earth is. The Bible does not say. But the concept that it, therefore, we can harmonize the age of the earth with a concept of millions and billions of years, that's not biblical either. The truth of the matter is that uh, the idea the Bible would give you is that the earth is relatively young. And the attempts made to, to some way harmonize the Bible with the theory of evolution or with the idea of the age of the earth has come up with the idea of taking the 24-hour days and turning them into geological ages. They try to make this ages fit in during the week of the creation. But I just want to quickly show you some things and then I have to move off this subject. 
The word day is from the Hebrew yom. And it's defined. The evening and the morning were the first day. It's defined there in the text. Now, evening and morning are used over a hundred times in the Old Testament, and they're always used, if you look at those texts, in a literal sense. Now, in Genesis chapter 1, 14, I've got to slow down here for those who are filming. It says there were lights in the firmament, and they were the purpose of signs and seasons and days and years. You stop and think about this. If the days in Genesis 1 were years, were, were ages, what were the years? Just stop and think about that. If the days were ages, what were the years? The language of that chapter really ought to be taken just in the ordinary sense. The word Yom Day, when it's preceded by a numeral, it normally means a 24-hour day, and it's found a hundred times in the Old Testament in that way. Now Moses could have modified the Hebrew Yom Day with the Hebrew adjective that meant long. Now he, he could have done that. Not only that, if Moses wanted to convey long periods of time, he could have used either of two, these work, two Hebrew words. Both of them indicate indefinite time period. The reason why I believe that we're to take the week of Genesis as an ordinary week is because there's a clear parallel in Exodus chapter 28 through 11. He's talking about six days you'll labor and the seventh day is a Sabbath on the Lord and it says in six days the Lord created the heavens and the earth and the seventh day he's rested. Notice further that the plural, the plural of day is used over 700 times in the Old Testament always refers to literal days and talks about six days and then on the seventh day. And let me just tell you this, you don't help anything by trying to make the days ages. It doesn't help because the sequence of events that are in the Genesis account simply do not fit the general theory of evolution. And we showed that the other evening. Now, I want to close before it's too late by quickly appealing to you to look around and see the world of things that are all around us that point to God. Four areas of evidence that show us creation. The earth perfectly fitted for life. How can you account for the thousand and one different circumstances that make it possible for life to exist upon this earth? All those who study the matter tell you the possibility of life as we have it on earth is such a narrow window and we have not yet been able to find it any place in the universe. When you take the place where the moon is and the place where the sun is, 240,000 miles away the moon, quarter of a million miles, the sun 90 million miles away. You talk about the land mass and you talk about the water and you talk about all that relating together. And what's the possibility of that just happening by chance? The earth being perfectly fitted for life is one of the strong arguments for the existence of God. It's incredible when you and I look around and think about what we see in this world. A. Cressy Morrison in his book, Man Does Not Stand Alone, says that if you want to talk about the mathematical probability factor in how life upon the earth could have just happened accidentally, or that how all this stuff could work together in the way that it does, put ten pennies in your pocket. These ten pennies, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Then ask what's the mathematical probability of pulling out number one the first time, and it's one in ten. What about one and two in that order? It's one in a hundred. What about one through ten? It's one in ten billion. That's ten little pennies in John's pocket. And then talk about the mathematical probability involved in what we have here upon the earth, it being perfectly fitted for life. Or turn in the second place to talk about the idea of cells, living things. I, I suggested to you earlier that all evolutionists would admit that what was essential for the existence of one cell, the first cell, to come into existence would be more complex than all the rest of evolution put together. In his book, Intelligent Universe, Fred Hoyle talks about taking this cell and thinking that here are thousands and hundreds of thousands of parts. And he says, if you talk about the mathematical probability at one one hundred thousandth part of a cell, then accidentally, it'd be like giving some man that's blindfolded a Rubik's Cube and then he gets busy and you find out how long, what are the chances, the probabilities of him being able to solve the problem. 
And he talked about it being one five or fifty quintillion. The number just gets to be almost meaningless. The point of the matter is that the complexity of cells is astounding. More amazing than all the rest of the so-called evolution put together. And Dr. Lewis Thomas in his book, The Medusa and the Snail, is talking about that, the first cell. And he says the mere existence of that shell, sh cell should be one of the greatest astonishments of the earth. People ought to walk around all day, all through their waking hours, calling to each other in endless wonderment, take, t talking of nothing except the cell. If anyone does succeed in explaining it within my lifetime, I will charter a skywriting airplane, maybe a whole fleet of them, and send them aloft to write one great exclamation point after another around the whole sky until all my money. Or take about, talk about atoms. When we split the atom and someone says after we did it and blew up the bomb, someone said they don't know whether there's a wisecrack or not. But whenever you smash atoms, the parts that you have are less in their mass than they were before and we've changed mass to energy and we've done it to the form of M equals or uh, M equals uh, E equals MC squared. I'll get it right. When you wash your mouth out, you can't do anything with it sometimes. Uh, E equals MC squared. E is ergs and M is the speed of light. That's 186 miles and miles per second. And what happens here is that we have created tremendous amounts of energy. Whenever we take a cubic inch of uranium, we can extract enough power to operate the average household in Birmingham, Alabama for 9,000 years. When we look at those facts, we're compelled to ask the question, cut power down in there in the first place? Or when you and I turn to the human body and we realize that the red blood cells, and there are approximately 30 million of them, in us, they live 120 days. White blood cells, the blood defense system, live about 13 days. Platelets, which help blood to clot, live about four days. Nerve cells may live over 100 years. In any given 60-second period, approximately 3 billion cells have died and been replaced in the human body, replaced by the process we call mitosis, whereby the standard chromosome number of the human, 46, is faithfully reproduced all at... You think what's gone on since I began speaking tonight in the human body. Or take the human eye. It's the most perfect camera ever known to man. So perfect is it that the very presence caused Charles Darwin to say that the eye with all its inimitable contrivances could have been formed by natural selection seems, I frankly confess, absurd in the highest degree. And he even said if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by necessary slight modification, my theory would absolutely break down and it does break down. Or take, for instance, the ear, the human ear. How wonderful it is to hear the voice of one that you love. My mother-in-law cannot hear a sound. And there's a sadness to it. And it's a sober reminder to me of what the Creator has made it possible for you and I to hear. You think about it. For example, the human ear and the human eye. The average piano can distinguish the sound of 88 keys. The human ear can distinguish over 2,500 different key tones. In fact, the human ear can detect sound frequencies that flutter the eardrums as faintly as one billionth of a centimeter, a distance one-tenth the diameter of a hydrogen atom. There are over 100,000 hearing receptors in the ear and are sending impulses to the brain to be decoded and answered. We're talking about when we look around us, Evidence of creation on every hand. Animal instincts, such as salmon. Salmon have the ability to hatch out. They've gone a thousand miles over the foaming brine of an ocean. When it comes time to lay their eggs, to go back with unerring accuracy, they've tagged them and they tested them and they checked on them. If they start off the wrong stream, they come back. This magazine that has this picture here in it says that they have a highly developed sense of smell. That is a smell. Animal instincts that give them the ability to pull off tremendous technical feats. All of these things compire together to tell us that there's a God. What I've been trying to do in this series from the beginning to the end, what I've been trying to emphasize and re-emphasizing is this. That when you look at the facts, we ask which is more reasonable. The universe exists. Which is the most reasonable? Something came from nothing or something always existed and what was it? The universe shows signs of design and purpose. What are the choices? Blind chance or divine planning? Man possesses a unique nature. What are the choices? Evolution or divine creation? And as we close this, I'd like to say this to you. Each of us have an opportunity in this life to be something, to amount to something. You need to understand who you are and why you're here and what God gave you for. 
And I close with these lines to encourage you to put the good fight of faith and to go out there and live as you should. As Longfellow once said, in the world's broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not like dumb driven cattle, be a hero in the strife. May God help us to move forward to heroism in living and defending his word in this world in which we live. I thank you.